Thank you. Amen. As we, as we pray tonight, let's remember Bridget Cocroft. She is in UNMC this evening. Um, just trying to figure out some different things going on with her headaches and her eyesight. Um, and so they're not really sure what's causing uh, her eyesight to diminish. But we need to really pray for her and lift up her name before the Lord tonight. Um, also, <clears throat> unspoken need for Brother Chuck and his family. Amen. Any other prayer requests tonight? Yes. Sister Duncan. Okay. Someone else? Yes. Okay. Jennifer Skelly. All right. Well, let's uh, enter into prayer together tonight. First, let's enter into his gates with thanksgiving. So let's put on our hearts of thanksgiving toward the Lord tonight. Jesus, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your many blessings. God, you're the anchor of the soul. You're the anchor of the mind and the emotion. You're the hope and you are the great burden bearer today thank you today father for being such a rock such a gibraltar such a steadiness in our life today that at any time and in any circumstance and in any situation you remain the same thank you that you're always present ever present help in the time of our need thank you father that i can find great rest in the holy ghost and i thank you lord for the refreshing of the holy ghost to reset my mind and reset my emotions, to reset, Lord, my thought processes, to reset, God, my drive and motivation to serve you. Thank you that you are the author and the finisher of my faith. Thank you, Lord God, that your word can come to us at any moment and refresh and renew our faith in you tonight. God, I thank you that we are not left alone and we are not left to ourselves. But Lord, that your ministering angels have come this evening to prepare God blessing and help and strength tonight in this congregation. I praise you for your help. And Lord, we thank you, God, that your eye is on us, that you care for us today. A lot of stress, a lot of weight, a lot of situations, a lot of concerns. But in everything we praise you, Lord, for my God shall supply all of my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I praise you, Lord. For your storehouses have not been emptied and your resources have not been spent, God. And your power has not been maxed out today. But there's renewed mercy every morning. Thank you for it. Thank you for it, God. That you're not at the end of your rope. That you're not at the end of your uh, availability and, and possibilities in our lives. I, and we confess the name and the power of Jesus Christ tonight. Thank you for your blood and your spirit. God, we, we lift these needs to you together tonight. Bridget Cocroft, Sister Duncan, and Sister Skelly, God. Needs of healing, needs of provision. God, we speak the word of Jesus Christ upon these needs. We're asking to hear from heaven, Lord. And, and Lord, hear our prayer and answer our cry and attend unto our needs, O oh Lord. For you are the maker of heaven and earth. We confess your name, Jesus, tonight. Lord, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you for the spiritual provision and sustenance that you're going to give us through your word. Minister and feed our souls by your word tonight, God. We be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated. There should be offering coming around. Thank you for your continued giving unto the Lord. Uh, Announcements, um, I have several this Friday, it is a district event, it's called Generation to Generation, it's put on by the Ladies Ministries uh, Department, and uh, it's at 7.30 at Life Tabernacle in Lincoln, Nebraska. If you'd like to know more information, you can see myself, again, that starts at 7.30 this Friday night, we have some singing and uh, some preaching. And uh, so 
Uh, if anybody would like to travel there, it's a short drive. Be several churches coming together for fellowship. Uh, a week from this coming Sunday, so April the um, first is that Sunday. A week from this Sunday is Easter Sunday. So I uh, want to encourage everyone to invite someone out for Easter services. We're going to have a great drama. We're actually having two times for the drama. It'll be Friday night, uh, Saturday night, sorry, March the 31st at 6 p.m. And then also Easter Sunday morning, April the 1st at 10 a.m. There will be no service on Easter Sunday on the p.m. service. So no 6 p.m. service we're having that on Saturday. Also tax tithe envelopes are out on the MyBCM desk. We designate these monies for different projects. We're just fixing to re-pour, refinish the floor in the Bethel Kids bathrooms. I'm doing a remodel over there, much needed. <clears throat> and uh, so we're excited about doing that. And then there's ASL sign language classes. You heard that announced on Sunday by the Deaf Ministry beginning this Saturday, March 24th. So that's this coming Saturday, March 24th, in the BCM prayer room from 10 to 1130. For more information, see Sister Poe. Uh, and there's also probably a sign-up sheet on the... Um, there's, there's two. There's one on the Get Involved wall and then one on the My BCM desk. So if you want to learn some more sign language for personal knowledge and then also to be able to communicate with our, with our deaf couple and uh, couples, and we'd love for you to join in that and be a part of what God's doing in that ministry. Amen. Isn't the Lord good? <sighs> Take a deep breath. We don't do that enough. God's gift of life is breath, isn't it? And sometimes we are too busy to even thank God for the breath of life. And I do thank God for that. And I'm just so appreciative of, of his blessing and promise to never leave us nor forsake us. As I began to study for... Um, this lesson, it actually grew, um, studying still a disciple, but uh, you'll notice your notes is a lot. I wanted to print out something, so if you have a pen or something, you can grab a pen, and we're going to do some underlining, underlining and some circling of some things. A lot of scripture. This is actually the entire book of First Peter chapter 1. And it was so good as I began to study and contemplate um, really what God had put on my heart. It led me to a scripture and then it just kind of unfolded and unfolded and folded and unfolded. And so here we are, we're probably going to have five lessons where we're just going to methodically walk down through the word of the Lord. The word of God is so powerful. Uh, God did not leave us handicapped, and the Bible is not without practical application. In fact, you're going to find that 1 Peter is so practical that it really gets into your daily living. <laughs> I mean, it really does mess with your thought process of how you should live on a day-to-day -day basis. And what your expectations need to be on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm excited to walk with you, privileged to walk with you together tonight through God's incredible, powerful word. Um, the, on the back, as it were, it kind of looks like it's the back. First Peter, you know, the date of the writing was um, 60 to 63 A.D. The theme of the book, as I studied and looked over the chapters and the content of the book of First Peter, the theme was suffering for Christ. Now that is exciting, isn't it? How many of you just really, really wish that you would have gotten for Christmas this year a big box wrapped beautifully? I mean, it was probably four feet long. It's really thin, but probably two feet tall, four feet long. And as you unwrapped it, you realized it was wall art with the word. 
suffering. And you thought to yourself, wow, that would go wonderful in my living room. How many of you would love to get a, some wall art, some decor that says suffering in big letter? Anybody? I don't think so. They don't sell much of that at Hobby Lobby. You won't find the word suffering in big letters in the decor, home decor, or home and gardens won't say suffering because it just doesn't sell. The word suffering is in itself uncomfortable. Just saying it really brings some not so nice feelings inside. But how many of you have felt suffering of some kind? You, you have been a personal friend of suffering. In one way or another, you have become one with suffering. You are aware of the reality of its existence in our life. And so that's the focus of the book of 1 Peter is suffering, but with intentionality. The suffering that comes because of Christ or a decision to follow Jesus Christ. There, there are some things that we suffer in life and they're kind of self-inflicted wounds. You, you follow what I'm saying? It's, it's not because of Christ. A lot of people, you know, they drive an 80, they get pulled over, they get a ticket, it sounds suffering for Christ. No, you're suffering from a lead foot. That's, that's, that's your suffering. And that happens for the saved and the unsaved. So that there's just general suffering. When you get sick, there's a certain amount of suffering. But you couldn't really say that I'm suffering for Christ because you're sick. But Paul is specifically talking in his letter about suffering that has come upon a believer or a disciple because and directly related to their uh, following Jesus Christ. It is a result of you saying yes to Jesus Christ. And there's some very real suffering that takes place when a person says, I will follow Jesus. Somebody help me out. What is some real suffering that takes place because someone says, I'm going to become a follower and I'm not turning back? Persecution, Persecution from where? That's a big word. From peers. Persecution from peers. Ostracized from family. Rejection. Is that because family doesn't like you anymore? It's just, it, it, there's sometimes, it's sad, it's heartrending. How many of you have felt it before? It's heartrending whenever you're trying to live your life the very best you can for Jesus Christ and that decision to become a better person, a, a, a spirit-led person, causes a division in your house or in your family tree. How, how hard is that, right? How about how, suffering for Christ? How many, someone else? Nobody? Nothing else? Suffering. Okay. Yeah, you, you're ridiculed scoffed at, made fun of for faith, okay? That, that's specifically brought on because you're not um, going the same direction as culture. You're not going, you kind of stick out. And how many of you know if you stick out sometimes in this world for the wrong thing, you're going to get poked fun at? Yes, sir. Wow. So, literally discriminated against <laughs> in the true sense of that word, that you cannot have a job because you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Someone else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you get a get big par a target on your back. Um, you know, uh, if you're really all in for Jesus Christ. The Bible says we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. So, you know, when you, when you say, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ, Satan is against anything that is God's and attacks anything that is God's. 
And so you have put yourself in a position uh, to be a target, to be uh, a target of the invisible foe, Satan, and all of his schemes. How about the world? The world itself, not just Satan, but the world itself is not a promoter of goodness of Christ. The system, it's not always Satan, although Satan uses that and manipulates that. The world itself is not kind toward uh, those who are true followers of Jesus Christ. Anybody else? Any other thing come to your mind about suffering for Christ? I don't know if you'd call it suffering from my vantage point. Giving to God is a blessing. I don't view it as suffering to pay tithe. I mean, I, I, I don't even, pro, I can't even think in my life, where have I really truly suffered because I follow Jesus? I have a hard time pointing to ah, somebody might laugh at me or make fun of me or roll their eyes or there's a Jesus guy again. But truly, I don't, I don't know that I can point to anything that says because I have followed Jesus Christ, I have really physically suffered. I have really, uh, meant, even mentally, I mean, some of it is, uh, you would say, because of Jesus Christ. Some of it might just because of self-esteem issues in my life. <laughs> you know, some of it really is just the weakness of my self-esteem. And so... I have a hard time thinking that whenever I pay tithe and I give and I'm trying to, to pattern a spirit of giving in my life that somehow I'm suffering. But the reality is, is that, is that if, you, if you made uh, $4,000 a month, just tithe is $400. Now, what could you do with $400 a month? That's a boat payment. Huh? That's a motorcycle payment. That's a good motorcycle. If you're paying $4,000 a month, sell the motorcycle. $400 a month. Uh, that's a vehicle payment. That's a decent retirement. Start, you know, putting away your retirement. I mean, $400 a month is a good chunk of change, right? But I, I don't look at that as suffering, but... But if you looked at that from the world's perspective, I cannot use that $400 for something else. I know it belongs to God. But I am choosing to do, I don't even feel like I'm doing without. God, you know, you know my heart. I am not doing without at all. But in the context of my disciplines to serve and follow Jesus Christ to the best of my ability, that money is gone, and I worked hard for it. God gave it to me. See, my vantage point is so totally different. So it's very hard for me to say I'm suffering. However, suffering for Christ. You could say, I don't enjoy some of the pleasures of the world. Again, my vantage point is, says, I am not suffering. I'm free from that. I've been liberated from that. Thank you, God. But in some sense, I don't go, go do some things. And sometimes people have a sense of loss because they don't go do those things. And so you have to somehow put that in a category of suffering that was brought on because I am choosing to follow Jesus. And so that word suffering for Christ can, can, can just grow a little bit in its definition and its understanding. But that is the focus of the book of 1 Peter uh, in its entirety is sufferings for Christ. And he gets very detailed. He gets very, very detailed in, in this book about the idea of suffering for Christ. The purpose, listen to this, the purpose of, of 1 Peter is to provide believers with a joyful hope. I want you to underline that word, joyful hope. Joyful. A divine and eternal perspective of their earthly life and godly practical guidance to those who were beginning to experience a fiery trial of suffering as followers of Jesus in a very pagan environment. 
So, wait a minute. So the entire thesis is, uh, of First Peter is that there's sufferings because of and for Christ, but in the midst of all of that, there is joyful hope in the midst of it. There are five major themes in, in the, the chapters of the book of 1 Peter. There's five chapters in 1 Peter, so five different major themes that run through those chapters. One is believers are strangers and pilgrims. Think about those words and the word pictures that come. Number two is that their Old Testament titles for God's people are applied to New Testament believers. For, for example, for example, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Ye also are lively stones, built up a spiritual house and holy Priesthood. Now, that word holy priesthood totally has its roots and origin in an Old Testament setting. And so if you don't know anything about the Old Testament, that just went right over your head. Because the, the priesthood was God's holy and anointed selection, divine selection, out of all of Israel. Uh, to offer up spiritual sacrifices. Again, the word sacrifices is an incredible word that, that, that really gets the impact of, of its value in the Old Testament. Um, verse 9 says, Ye are a chosen generation, a direct correlation to Old Testament Israel, but has been given and and transplanted and stuck on the head and the forehead of those in the church of the followers of Jesus Christ. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. Now this is an incredible, incredible thought process. Old Testament titles for God's people are applied to New Testament believers. So those words, holy priesthood, peculiar people, or special, or set apart people, a holy nation now just doesn't belong to Israel, Old Testament, but now belongs to church, New Testament believers. Again, this is very rich in Old Testament theology and understanding. So, Old Testament titles. Um, thirdly, as five major themes, is instructions on how to respond as a disciple to unjust persecution and suffering. Everybody say unjust. It's one thing to suffer when you deserve it. I suffered many times in my home. I remember one time I was in Target. I don't know if it was Target. It might have been Piggly Wiggly or something back then. I don't know. It wasn't Target. But uh, what's another name of an old grocery store or Kmart-esque place growing up? What's that? Baker's? Nah, like reach way back, way back. Woolworth. Oh, I haven't heard that for a long time. Give me another one. Montgomery Ward. Oh, catalog and all. Who? Never heard of that. From Alaska? Pennsylvania? Jimco. Never heard of it. Pomida. I never heard of a Pomida until in 90. Uh, 92, I was driving here to see my Michelle and, and everybody, and I'm like, Pomida. And then Shop KO. I called it Shop KO for the longest time. I didn't even know it was Shop KO. Like somebody KO'd Shop. That's sad. Sears and Roebuck. Anybody? Any any later stores than that? Sears and Roebuck's been around forever. What? Gordon. Oh, that's old. Wow, we're reaching way back for that one. Thank you, Cassie. Who's that? A M P. A and P. What does that stand for? Oh, well. Okay. So I'm at a Pomida, Piggly Wiggly, whatever. And my parents were going down aisle seven, and I'm going down aisle three. Now I'm talking about self-inflicted is suffering, and, and I'm talking about uh, this idea um, uh, that unjust persecution and suffering is one of the themes. 
And so I come across this little Hot Wheels car that was out of the package. And I wanted it. And I was in a dilemma. Because I didn't have no money. And I get around the first corner, and I, I'm thinking I got away with it, you know. And I'm with my mom and my dad. And the store clerk comes up and says, excuse me, sir, ma'am, I'm talking to my mom and dad. Excuse me, sir, but your son took something that doesn't belong to him. <laughs> Caught. So needless to say, the embarrassment of apologizing to the store clerk right there. And then when I got home, there was some suffering involved. <laughs> but it was not unjust, right? It was not unjust. That's one thing for us to suffer. But Paul deals with this idea that when people of faith encounter mistreatment directly because of their Christian commitment and, and Jesus' commitment, that there are certain ways that we are to respond. And they're not like the world responds. So he, he deals with that. Uh, number four, he revolves around disciples who are facing persecution because of their identity with Jesus Christ. And fifthly, he reveals insights of Jesus preaching to imprisoned spirits. Now this is mind-boggling. Jesus preaching to imprisoned spirits which were disobedient and judged in Noah's day. So that, that just blows my mind. And so we get some incredible insights uh, in uh, the major five themes. Uh, the chapter survey, chapter one survey, is there's a greetings to Christians in verse one and two. Then there's a reminder that they have been a glorious calling. Then their faith and love in this life will be subjected to some tests. Then this great salvation was foreseen by Old Testament prophets. And believers must live holy lives clearly different from the ungenerated world around them. So what I want to do tonight is I want, us, I want us to start. Now, I've got this in the New Living Translation, and it's printed right there for you. So I want you to, as I'm reading it to you, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to, I'm going to um, highlight some things that, that really kind of jumped out to me as I made my way down through this, and I was looking and surveying the Word of God. These things jumped out at me, but if, so I'm going to say some things. I want you to underline those things that, that I pull out. But then if, if I'm reading it and something really jumps out at you and you go, wow, it piques your interest, I want you to circle that because there's something inside of you that you might want to take this home and you might want to read and ask God, hey, what's this little jumping inside of me about? What, what is this um, that is causing my spirit to kind of jump, okay? So let's read this. And this is just going to take a little bit of time, um, but I really feel like it will minister to you tonight. Okay, chapter 1, verse 1. This letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The first thing in that verse 1 is living as foreigners. I want you to underline that. Living as foreigners. Now, there, there is a whole Bible study. In fact, each one of these points I felt I could preach a message on. <laughs> could you preach a message on living as foreigners? What does that mean? What, what does that entail? If we're really to embrace and grab a hold of this idea from the Apostle Paul that we are just foreigners, what does that have to do with suffering? Why? What, why does that have to do with suffering for Christ? Well, we're foreigners. We don't belong here. We're outsiders at best. We're transient and we're moving through. So, I mean, there's so many different ways you can go with that. Verse 2. God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and His Spirit made you holy. As a result, you have obeyed Him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. A couple of things out of this verse. Number one, God knew you and chose you long ago. Hmm, that's cool. That is cool. 
Secondly, His Spirit made you holy. Wow. His Spirit separated you. When you received the Holy Spirit of God, He, uh, he, he pulled you aside unto Himself. He adopted you uh, from the, the, the fatherless orphans. And now He's pulled you into the sonship. That's exciting. There's an adoption. Um, it says you have obeyed Him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's so, so I, man, boy, could I, could I talk a while about you and God work together in this thing called salvation. God makes holy, but there is an obedience. And, and when we obey the gospel, there is a cleansing that happens. Thank God for the blood. Uh, verse 3, all praise to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Oh, when I read over that, my heart just jumped. I, I don't know if you know this yet or not, but I love preaching about being born again. I, I, I just can't get over being saved. I just can't get over the fact that I was lost and now I'm found. I... I it's, it's what I go to. You, you give me half an inch, I'm going to steer left every time. I'm going to go there. Uh, it's changed my life. I'll never be the same. When I finally got to the place where I let God be in control of my life, He gave me a new future. He gave me a destiny. He gave me a hope. He gave me something to live for. I can't get over it. So, you know, being born again. Now watch this. Uh, hopefully you're underlining some of this stuff. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation. I want you to under, underline great expectation. Oh, I, I, I want to preach to you. I want to ask you a question. Do you have great expectation in your heart? We're, we're coming up on Easter here pretty quick. And, 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 and Peter said, because Jesus rose again, we should have and live with an ever-present great expectation. Is it on the top of your list of, expect, of expected things? Is it on your radar? Oh, praise God. Um... Verse 4, and we have a priceless inheritance. Underline priceless inheritance. I thought that was especially incredible. Priceless. Priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. Where is your expectation? Where is your hope? I love it. It's, it's kept in heaven. <laughs> not in a bank. Not in Wells Fargo. You know, not, not in Fort Knox. But it is in heaven. Kept in store. It's beyond decay. It won't lose its value. Thank you, Jesus. The interest rates won't go up or down. It holds its value out of reach of change and decay. Thank you, God, for a priceless inheritance that is beyond decay. Verse 5, through your faith, underline that, through your faith, say through my faith. This is why faith is so valuable. The, the, all of this inheritance, your inheritance, your future, is not based on my faith. It's based on your faith. It's, it's, it's based upon your understanding of its priceless value. Through your faith, he says, God is protecting you by His power until you receive this salvation. That's great. Which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Now there's so much in that verse. 
your, through your faith, God is protecting you. Do you know if you don't have faith, then God's protection shrinks? How many know that faith is a shield? And it's your faith in Him that determines how much of God's protection can cover you. So as is your belief in Him, so is your protection from Him. Because it is a, is a shield about us. And so on and on and on we go. Now I want you to know, receive this salvation. I want you to understand this salvation. So what I've stepped into when I was born again, I was saved. Everybody follow me. I was saved from sin. Somebody say, I was saved. I am currently being saved. And there is a salvation that I'm going to step into if I will continue in the faith. So salvation is not just a one-time thing. It is an elastic word Bishop brought, said to me years ago. And it stretches from, from even when God begins to draw somebody all the way till they step foot into glory land. So I, I, I was saved, thank God, that's referring to born again. I am being saved, talking about the refining work of sanctification in my life. And I will be saved, talking about glorification. So you got justification, sanctification, and glorification that all has and is part of the word salvation. So am I ever finished? Not until I have been glorified. Have I really received the full payment of this thing called gospel salvation? Wow. So there's still more? Tell somebody, there's still more. There's still more in front of us. There is much in front of us as there is behind us. In fact, more. So, wow, there is, a, uh, there is that word. I want that to stick in your mind. I was saved, I'm being saved, and I shall be saved. <laughs> God's never finished until He's finished. So, verse 6, So be truly glad. Say, so be truly glad. Say it. Be truly glad. About what? What is the source of a Christian's joy? What is now? Maybe in part. I can have some joy about where I used to be and where I am now. God is doing some things in my life that are bringing great joy. But there's also greater joy yet to be experienced. So many people are trying to find happiness in relationships that are earthly. And while that is true, you can find some strength, some comfort in, in earthly relationships. And those are blessings from God. But there is nothing that will keep the soul, your soul, like salvation. And faith and the joy that Jesus Christ gives in your life. So if you're here today and, and you're thinking that, well, I will be happy when my marriage relationship looks like this, you can make a difference in your marriage. Yes, you can. And you can improve some joy factor in your marriage. But I'm going to tell you, there, there's no satisfaction really in this earth that will really take you all the way. It's, life is too complicated. <laughs> About the time you get one relationship settled, another one, the bottom drops out. Right? There's always some good and some bad and everything. So as Christian believers, our source of true joy and contentment is not in relationships around us. Those add to our contentment, but they are not the source of our contentment. So there's real, true joy in serving the Lord. There is wonderful joy ahead. Underline joy ahead. <laughs> I could see that on a, on, a, on, a, on a slide as I preach. Joy 
straight ahead. I can talk to you about the joy that's coming. Even though you must endure many trials for a little while. Oh, here's where it gets a little sticky. You're going to endure many trials. Underline, underline that. Endure many trials. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It, your faith, is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. Oh, that's good. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, underline many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. I, uh, I had a roll of Gorilla Tape on my desk. You know what Gorilla Tape is? Black, about that thing. It's the cousin to duct tape. And it's supposed to be the bigger, badder, meaner cousin. Thus, gorilla. Plus a marketing scheme, right? Probably the same stuff. But it's in a class called PST. Pressure, or PS, yeah, it's pressure sensitive adhesive tape, or PSA. It's self adhesive. It's self-stick adhesive in a major category of adhesive tapes and is a relatively thin, flexible material with a single or double-sided coating. PSA will adhere to uh, a variety of substrates. How many of you know that's true? Duct tape will stick to almost anything. Uh, when applied to most clean, dry surfaces, pressure-sensitive adhesives do not require solvent, water, or heat to activate the adhesive. The bond, here's the key, the bond is directly influenced by the amount of pressure which is used to apply the adhesive to the surface. So the more pressure, the more stickiness. Right? If you just lay a piece of duct tape down, generally, without much pulling, you can pick it up. But if you would on this carpet, put it down, then walk on it. That's a different story. Getting it up. Because pressure has a great deal to do with how it sticks to the surface. Did, and and, and what, what the Apostle Peter is saying, he was saying that our faith can stick, but it's pressure sensitive. And if, if, if you're going to have a faith that sticks, there's going to have to be some pressure put on you. And Peter wanted the disciples, the, the believers to know, don't bail under pressure. Because what you think is against you is actually going to work for you. He's specifically talking about the trials or the suffering that, are a, that is a direct response from being a follower of Jesus. So you can respond one of two ways when this kind of suffering comes into your life. You can run from it and bail and therefore, your faith doesn't have much value, doesn't have much stickiness to it. But the more you maintain your, your focus and diligence toward Jesus Christ, even through the pressure, your faith is going to stick better. How many of you know that to be true? So your faith is pressure sensitive. And it needs pressure. Someone once said, if I can get it right, they, they said, if your faith really hasn't been tested, you don't even know if you have faith. 
How do you know that you really believe in God if it hasn't come up against some resistance? You may have a preference for God <laughs> instead of a conviction for God. Hmm. So, the trying of your faith is part of the process of being a believer. Trials reveal that your faith is genuine. If we continue on, your love, you love Him even though you have never seen Him. That's awesome. Though you do not see Him now, you trust Him. Anybody trust in Jesus? You ain't never seen Him. You seen a picture of Him, but that, nobody had a Polaroid back then. Nobody had selfies back then. Michelangelo tried his best. We're not sure where he was in all of his extracurricular activity. We're not real sure. Don't know. Man. We love him, but we've never seen him. You rejoice with glorious, inexpressible joy. Is that how you feel about serving Jesus? I, I'm reminded of the story. I've got to hurry. I'm reminded of the story. Isaac must have been too busy, had to work too much overtime, or he was just lazy. Or maybe he didn't even want a wife. I don't know. Wasn't there. But the Bible says that Abram sent his servant into a far country to get a wife for his son. Go get your own. I found mine. Thank you. So the servant goes out and finds a wife from his wife's ancestry. I believe it was, Laban, and that whole family. This whole family ties her all together. You've got to be careful in the Old Testament. So out of a miraculous set of circumstances, a prayer from Abram's servant, a, a woman that was willing to draw water for camels that weren't even hers, the servant then gives the family some gifts in exchange for the daughter that he's going to take back and present to Isaac, who's, she's never seen him. She's only been told about him. So she's on the camel, and she's riding into that land of Canaan, and in the distance, there's a figure. And the servant must have been telling that bride-to-be about what he looked like. Because she had never seen him. But in her mind and in her heart, the closer she got, the more excited she became. Are we almost there? And then there's that figure coming up from the distance. And she says, is it him? And the Bible says that she jumped off her camel, I believe, and ran to see her husband. She had never seen the man. That's awesome. What a picture that is of the New Testament church. With inexpressible joy, waiting for our groom, Jesus, to show up. Do you feel that way today? I have never seen him. But if I'll meditate on it just a minute, I get more excited the more I think about it. He's coming back. Inexpressible joy, the Bible says. I really think that, that we would do well to let our minds imagine in that area a little more. I don't think we daydream enough about Him.
coming back for us. It is our greatest expectation as the church. Mm. It, it is the greatest expectation. The Word of God never, hear me, this is not in your notes. The Word of God never promotes this life as the goal, ultimate goal of a believer. Not one time does it ever tell us to say, this is my best life. That's what the world tries to get you to tell about yourself. I'm going to have a best life now. There's a song. And I understand what that song is saying. But brothers and sisters, I got suffering for Christ and, and I'm blessed. I am very blessed. And I thank God for my life. But if that is my goal, I am so short-sighted. And I am underselling the entire Word of God. The world is still not our home. We're still pilgrims. And we still only drive our tent stakes so deep. Not because we're told we can't, but we don't want to be tied down to anything here. We are purposeful not to pull the knot too tight so as though we can't get it undone quickly. I don't want my heart tied to anything here so much that I can't go to it and untie it and say, come on, Lord. I want to see you. If we lose this, we have lost our ability to suffer correctly with and for Christ. This is what enables and empowers us to forgive when we want to retaliate. This is what empowers us to just dust it off, shake it off, and step up. Anybody ever heard that old story about that mule that fell in a hole? Should I be Shirley Caesar right now? <laughs> the farmer couldn't, couldn't figure out how to get that old bull out of that hole he didn't have any straps didn't have the wherewithal didn't have what he needed and so he says well I'm just going to bury the bull I guess and so he, shovel at a time he began to show, shovel that, that dirt on top of that bull's back and that bull would just shake it off and start stomping just shovel after shovel just shake it off keep stomping before long that bull started to rise and he shook it off and stu st uh, stood up enough or stepped up enough that he actually shook himself, shook it off enough that he got out of that hole. Brothers and sisters, there's going to be sufferings for Christ. And we're going to have to have something that gets us to shake it off and keep stepping. Don't get mad at around you. Don't start pointing. For, just shake it off and start stepping up. This is suffering for Christ. It's part and parcel to being a Christian. Oh, hallelujah. So, we love Him. The reward of trusting Him will be the salvation of your souls. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know about, uh, more about when they prophesied about the gracious salvation prepared for you. So the Old Testament prophets prophesied about something that wasn't even for them. They wondered what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and the great glory that would follow. That's an amazing verse. The Old Testament prophets were moved upon by the Spirit of Christ that was in them to write about his own sufferings that was yet to come. Blown mine right there. Watch this. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who prepared the uh, preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. What? 
So the Spirit of Christ was in the Old Testament prophets prophesying of the grace that was come, and it was that same Spirit of Christ in Peter. On the day of Pentecost was fully come, Peter spoke in tongues. He was filled with the Spirit of Christ. It was that same Spirit that began to declare the gospel through him about this great gospel message. It was so wonderful that even angels are eagerly watching these things happen. Look at verse 13. So prepare your minds, underline that, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Underline exercise self-control. If there's any suffering, guess where suffering can be found most often in America that needs to happen? I just told you the answer. self Control. How many of you know if you've got to control self, you feel like you're suffering? How many of you know if you tell your flesh no, it kind of starts squirming? Anybody got a two-year-old inside? No! It's like you're nailing that thing to the cross. A lot of people say, well, I, I, just, I, I, I just can't stop. The devil makes me do it. No, you don't want to suffer. He gets into that. In chapter 4, he said, oh yeah, when you tell your flesh no, guess what it does? It rebels. But it's for the sake of Christ. I'm not going to do this because my eyes are going somewhere else. I'm not going to engage in this because my heart is somewhere else. I'm going to say no here so I can say yes here. Many people want to be able to say yes to everything. They're yes people. Yeah, what? I want sin and hell and... Uh, fornication and lust, and I want a uh, debauchery of all kinds. Give me all flavors, 31 flavors. And then come on, oh yeah, I want Jesus too. You know, just give me all of Jesus and heaven and gold and cake and ice cream and everything in the middle. Just have one and all. Give it to me. You can't, be, you can't be a yes man to your flesh and a yes man to the Spirit. It doesn't work. That's why there's real suffering that needs to happen in our lives. But the only way is for us to get a vision of inexpressible joy. That's for us. Okay. Ah. Prepare your minds for action and exercise self control Put all your hope in the grace. Everybody said put all your hope. <laughs> you have any hope left? Just hanging around? Where is it supposed to go? In the grace of salvation that will come. That will come. It's not here yet. It will come. So all your proverbial eggs are in. Isn't that fun? Where's your wife? She's not the basket. You got it? All, Nate Rose, all of your hope in one basket. How many of you know that's not easy to do? How many of you, like me, get distracted? And you have little hopes everywhere. And if you're not careful, you start stockpiling some hope over here that belongs in that basket. Let me tell you, if you can get depressed to the point where you're going to quit church, you've been putting hope somewhere else than in the right basket. If you leave the church... I don't care for what. If you leave, what does that tell me? 
you've got two baskets. One basket, and it's not getting married. <laughs> it ain't having kids. Although those are awesome. I'll lend you one. You can't have them. One basket. See, the world wants you to diversify. <laughs> That's called hedging your bets. Because if it falls through here, I got a safety net. How many of you, we are safety netted out. How many got insurance for insurance? Come on. That's great for this life, but it won't work for heaven. Prepare your minds. Verse 14, so you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. That's the second basket. You didn't know any better then. Underline then. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. You must be holy in everything. Underline everything. For the scripture says you must be holy because I am holy. And remember that heavenly father to whom you pray has no favorites. Under, underline no favorites. He will judge and reward you according to what you do. Underline according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. Underline temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom. Oh, would you underline a ransom to save you from the empty life. Somebody underline empty. I could preach to you about living for nothing. An empty life. You inherited this empty life from your ancestors. But no matter how much money or education is in your ancestry line, it's empty if you don't have Christ. It's empty. Empty life from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ. Underline that. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose Him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, He has been revealed for your sake. Underline revealed for your sake. Through Christ, you have come to trust in God and you have placed your faith and hope in God because He raised Christ from the dead and gave Him great glory. You were cleansed from your sins, underline that. When you obeyed the truth, underline that. You can't be cleansed from your sins if you're disobedient to the gospel. So now you must show sincere love. Everybody underline sincere love. To each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply, underline deeply, and with all your heart. Underline it. For you, you've been born again. Underline that. But not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living word of God. Verse 24, as the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. Underline that. The word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is good news or the gospel that was preached to you. This gospel that you've been given is one of the most precious things that anyone, anywhere has ever given you. Underline it, circle it, asterisk that. It was given to you. Let's stand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that my faith is pressure sensitive. That when the pressure's on, I can't just look at the here and now. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. I'm a temporary traveler. I'm just here for a short time. I thank you for the faith that you've given to me. 
It's precious and its value is greater than gold and silver. Thank you for the protection that comes through faith in you, Lord God. Empower your believers today to keep that faith and to suffer patiently for the cause of Christ. I give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. I love you all.